Welcome to the Givology Impact Series podcast, in which we share the experiences and inspirations of social entrepreneurs and change makers around the world in education. I'm Bandana. We are delighted to have Margot Miller from Appalachian Community Fund here with us today. The Appalachian Community Fund, ACF, funds and encourages grassroots social change in central Appalachia. As a community controlled fund, ACF offers leadership to expand and strengthen the movement for social change through its practices and policies. Margo Miller is the Executive Director of Appalachian Community Fund. Miller has served as the Development Director of ACF for the past three years and raised more than $540,000 to support social justice work in Central Appalachia. Miller is a daughter of Appalachia and graduated from the University of Tennessee with a degree in Broadcast Communications. Miller remained in Knoxville after graduation, working as a community organizer, facilitator, project director, and administrator for a number of key social justice organizations. She has developed a deep commitment to art as a powerful tool for organizing and uniting communities. Thanks so much for taking the time to speak with us, Margot. Oh, thank you. Thanks for having me. Great. To start off, can you share with us the story of Appalachian Community Fund's founding and mission? I would love to. Um, ACF um, was founded back in 1987 uh, to bring new resources uh, for grant funding uh, to groups working on progressive social change in central Appalachia. And we we identified that particular area of all the Appalachian counties of East Tennessee, Kentucky, Southwest Virginia, and the entire state of West Virginia. And we really want to build up, um, we want to be a sustainable resource base for those groups that are working on social change in the region. And in, um, in, since our founding, we've uh, granted over $6.5 million to more than 300 grassroots organizations working on social change in the area. Um, and it's been, um, <laughs> I've not been there all that time, but, you know, since the time we've, we've helped to really provide financial support needed to help, um, you know, low-income people and um, people organizing themselves to address all the systemic systems of poverty and oppression in the region. Um, and it's been a, a wonderful time here <laughs> doing the work. Wow, it's really impressive. So can you um, tell us a little bit about some of ACF's accomplishments in the past few years and your highest priority projects today? Sure. Um, there's been a lot of success work that we do um, around creating change. Um, we, one of our grantees won a settlement um, up by the decision of a court uh, for helping um, more than Five hundred thousand um, dollars to do work around protecting the water in Kentucky. Um, we've had another grantee group that successfully advocated for adopting um, a thirty-minute daily activity policy in uh, childcare centers. Uh, given that a lot of places have cut funding for recesses, we thought that was really successful work to advocate for making sure that those children in those daycare centers had uh, act, active time that they would play. Um, we have had, um, we reached 5,000 undocumented immigrants in Tennessee with information about um, their rights, uh, using administrative uh, relief to avoid deportation. And one of the most successful stories uh, recently, uh, we had um, a grantee approach us for a very small grant that went on to later organize a group of people under a campaign called Hands Off Appalachia. And after three years of grassroots organizing and direct action, UBS, which uh, was one of the largest supporters, bank supporters, uh, backed away from funding mountaintop removal, and that was one of the largest ones that we've had. And as far as some of the new priorities uh, that, that we're working on, uh, we have a new program called Out in the South, uh, which is advocating for uh, organizing uh, the queer community in Appalachia, identifying their issues, and raising money to address their issues. Uh, we're, so that's something that we've recently started working on is working with um, 
with that particular community here in central Appalachia. Yeah, that's some really great work. And I know your organization has the motto, change not charity. How do you measure the change that you deliver through your grantees? And like specifically, what type of qualitative and quantitative metrics do you use to assess the success of your grantees? Well, I can tell you uh, measuring change is not easy uh, because change, mm -hmm. uh, change, change does take a long time. So, it, yeah. uh, you know, the, looking at the whole thing, going, just going back to the motto, change, not charity. The reason that we look at that is because a lot of organizations, particularly foundations, um, you know, give, give things to people. And while that's great, uh, looking at our motto, um, you know, while, it, while it's good to be able to teach someone how to fish, uh, we think it's even better to, um, well, it, it's good to give someone food or give someone a fish, but it's better to teach them to fish. And even better mm -hmm. than teaching them to fish, it's um, making sure that everyone has a boat, you know, making sure everyone has mm -hmm. a fishing pole. And even better still, making sure that um, you can then organize a community to form a local um, fishing cooperative where people, you know, have a fish market that's control, controlled and owned by the community. Um, that's better. So. It, it, that's a long way around saying that when we when we look at measuring change, it really depends. Look, looking at when things change, when systems change in communities, that's when we know that we've done good work, or that we know we've supported good work. And looking at our grantees that are able to change some of these long-standing policies in communities, that's a successful. Um, that's that success. And as far as how we measure it, one of the things that we have on our on our final reports for our grantees, we ask them to share stories of success. You know, we ask them to mm -hmm. share stories of challenge so other people can possibly learn from the challenges. So we don't do a lot of quantitative uh, measurements uh, with our organization because it's more about the quality of the change that mm -hmm. happens in the community. Yeah, that's really interesting. So um, in the communities that you work with, what are like the responses that you guys see? And how do you address perhaps if any community resistance, if there is any at all? Oh, there's plenty of community resistance. When you're talking about changing systems that have been in place for many years, uh, you see a lot of resistance. But uh, there's also people within the community who have been in those communities and they won't change. They want, they don't want to deal with the status quo. So most of the people that we work with are those people. They're the people out there who are most affected, you know, day in, day out um, by the oppressive systems that are in place um, here in Appalachia. So their responses are <clears throat> overwhelming. They're very grateful that ACF is there to provide them with support because a lot of times ACF will give grants to people that, or organizations that are, you know, either too small or too new or too progressive to get funding from other organizations. So they're very grateful for the funding that we give them. We have been told that, you know, ACF gave us our first grant. Um, ACF uh, will do multi-year funding. ACF will do general operating support. So a lot of people are very grateful for that support. Um, and it, it, puts, it enables people to stand up to the resistance that they have in the community mm -hmm. for the work that they're doing. That's great. So on the same note, what are some of the challenges you guys have faced as an organization? How have you approached or are you approaching these difficulties? I think with a lot of, like a lot of, a lot of organizations, uh, the biggest challenge that we have faced over the years, at least the few years that I've been, I've been the executive director, um, ACF uh, is not like many other foundations that have a large endowment, they, like they start off with a lot of money. So we have to raise all the money that we operate on, and we also raise the money that we, that we do for grant making. Um, so that has been the largest uh, thing. And then also not having, um, not having a, a space of our own, you know, very similar to our grantees, uh, not owning our own space. So whenever someone decides that they're, they're going to, you know, do something different with the space that we're in, we have to move. So 
um, those have been some of the largest challenges that we um, that we faced over the years. And as far as um, how we're approaching the difficulties, you know, we're we're strong, small but mighty, <laughs> in our mm-hmm. our thinking in our mindset. You know, we keep we keep pushing on, and I think that that goes back to that whole Appalachian spirit of you know, we are small, but we are mighty, and we're not going to let anything hold us down. We're going to keep going. So um, that's kind of the spirit in which we've approached it. Um, And also looking at other ways of, you know, creative ways of raising money and um, creative space making. Um, I think those are the things that we've done uh, to face those difficulties. We're holding our chin up, basically. (laughs) Yeah, that's really important. I think that mindset and the small but mighty thing. I Yeah. So also in our research, we came across some works that discuss some of the cultural aspects of Appalachia that have contributed to intergenerational poverty. From your experience in these communities, what have been the most effective strategies to fight intergenerational poverty? I think it's when you get, uh, when you get people together. Uh, a long time, there was a big trend of doing intergenerational work. It's when you have the elders of the community come together and sit down with the young folks of the community, talking about history, sharing stories, uh, you know, sort of attempting not to repeat some of the same mistakes over and over again. Um, there's also a movement um, led by a group of young folk, like I think between the ages of 14 and 30, it's called the STAY Project. And it's a group of young organizers who are committed to developing themselves as the future leaders of Appalachia. They want to stay here. They don't want to do like so many folks have done. You know, once they become of age, there's not a lot of opportunity for them. So a lot of people leave the area. So this group of young leaders, they're working to develop themselves, develop their skills, uh, work with others to create job opportunities for people in the area. Um, so they can stay and they can be a part of building uh, a more sustainable, uh, transformative Appalachia. That's one of the specific things that I've seen. And and I think that that strategy is right. We've got to have places for people to work. We have to have affordable places for people to live. We have to have um, environments and places where people feel it's safe to raise a family. So those are some of the things that people have been doing to uh, make sure that this is a place where people can call home for many, many years. Um, making sure that people can see themselves in Appalachia, you know, as um, what I call, I, I'm a proud black mountain woman. Uh, I'm, a, I'm an Appalachian uh, woman. And uh, to be able to see myself um, in this culture and to know and own it as myself, that's important to me. And there's, there's a lot of other people that are doing the same thing. There's a, uh, a, a group called Blacks in Appalachia and that was recently launched to sort of highlight and and tell the stories of, of, of the black folks that are here. You know, some of the people that have felt like they're missing. Apple Shop does a really good job of telling stories of people that are from here, you know, bringing out the things that make people proud of being able to call this place home. And Appalachian Voices is another uh, publication, online publication, that does a really good job of highlighting and celebrating um, being here in Appalachia. So I think if we continue to celebrate and create opportunities, um, we're going to be okay. We'll overcome all those stereotypes. Yeah, definitely. That's really great to hear about, like, the notion of seeing oneself and their culture and pride at home and all those getting people together. Yeah, when you can feel comfortable in a place, um, you know, it really really does help. And, you know, that's one of the things a lot of people are doing. Um, You know, young folk, uh, working with immigrant populations, uh, and like I said, the whole thing of working with, you know, the black folks that are here, uh, it's all very important to be able to see oneself and to celebrate our contribution to the area, and it helps yeah. us want to invest more for the future of Appalachia. Definitely, investing in future leaders is really important, and especially um, in today's fractious political climate, there's a lot misunderstood on the broader Appalachian region. So what are some of the key misconceptions in the communities and the economy that you guys work with in this region? Um, I guess the misconceptions go, you know, way back. Uh, Folks think that people of Appalachia are backward, 
they think that we all run around barefooted uh, and and it, you know that misconception <clears throat> you know is extremely harmful because it, it paints a picture of an uneducated not healthy community and it's quite different uh, we're very uh, very proud very you know strong folks um, might not necessarily be such a misconception because a lot of the the, the items or the things that uh, folks here were able to make a living at no longer exist like one time once upon a time this was a big coal country where a lot of people mm -hmm. if it wasn't then it was someone in their family that worked for a coal company well a lot of those jobs have gone away I know that even in my family, um, you know, some of the folks worked in mills, you know, whether it was a hosiery mill, a, a, a knitting mill, a bread factory, a lot of those jobs w went away. And like in other parts of the, of the United States, you know, once those jobs go away, you know, people that have worked for many generations doing those jobs, the jobs go away, what are they gonna do? So I, I think, it's not so different than the rest of the world. Like you look at Detroit, you know, when the, the car industry went away and their economy mm -hmm. tanked. Um, I think it's very similar to what that, that happens all over the place. It's just that some of the things that, you know, people once made money here, it's just a little bit different. You know, it wasn't cars, it was it was a coal mine or the mills. And when those things went away, it, it really left a, a dent, uh, a big hole for people. Uh, but people are looking at developing other other economies. There's a big push right now. I, I know in Kentucky, you know, that was once a big um, growing industry. Uh, they're looking at growing hemp as a possibility for, you know, building up a sustainable economy. Uh, there are other places here that are looking at uh, solar power, you know, being a, a resource for creating, you know, solar panels for, you know, the whole United States. That's another thing that we're doing to try to make our economy more robust. So uh, we are, we have taken a, a bit of a hit, but people are out there trying to find other ways of uh, developing the economy. And you see a lot of it in, um, in food, a lot of like farm to table type of models. People are doing that uh, to rebuild the community or to rebuild the economy. And also looking at technology, um, given that, I mean, even this call today, the two of us are having a conversation but we're not even in the same room together. So people are trying to be a little bit more creative and innovative at building up the economy. But we're not that yeah, different definitely. from the rest of the world. We're not that different from the rest of the world, really. <laughs> yeah, it's clearly a very forward-looking community. I think that really resonates with that small but mighty mindset yeah. you guys have. Yeah. So, and lastly, what are your goals for the years to come? And what can our listeners do to get involved? Well, our, our definitely our, our goals uh, for the future is one thing, since ACF is out there to help support, uh, you know, grassroots organizations. We ourselves are a grassroots organization. So looking at stabilizing yourself to make yourself more sustainable. Um, uh, you like the small but mighty. We are small but mighty, but we also realize that we need to grow a little bit. So one of our goals is to, to grow the organization in a way where we can be even more sustainable for, uh, for the future. Um, so we definitely need, um, we, we need people that are interested in doing this work to make that happen. Um, we're also looking at developing um, giving circles or sort of like donor driven individually driven uh, donor uh, work. Mm -hmm. So people that looking at putting the power in the hands of the community, instead of having to rely on, you know, seeking money from outside the region, we're looking at uh, empowering the communities that we work in and see that they too have the power to fund and do the work that's important to them. They don't always have to go outside of themselves to do the work. Yeah. Um, so that is one of the things that, uh, one of the priorities that we're working on is establishing those giving circles within the communities that we work. Because if every community um, had a monthly meeting and everybody put a dollar in the jar, at the end of the year, mm -hmm. you'd be amazed at how much money that you have at the end of the year. 
uh, to do the work that is needed in your community. So that's one of the things, one of our, one of our priorities is making that sustainable for the groups. Yeah, that's really wonderful. And thank you so much for taking the time to participate in our Impact Series podcast. We're really excited to continue following Appalachian Community Fund and the many exciting developments that come. Thank you.